that would be a stretch. <coughs> um, pick up on page 60. This is, we're still in that chapter, Shadow of the Past. And we just finished the scene where Frodo says Gollum deserves death, and I went off on that little spiel about all that. Um, Frodo asks Gandalf, well, why did you tell me to throw it away? Why did you tell me to destroy it? He's like, what do you mean? Let you, make you? Haven't you been listening? He says, the rings have a way of being found. He says, of course it's dangerous for you, Frodo, and that troubled me deeply. So Frodo asks him, but why not destroy it, as you should have, as should have been done long ago? If you had warned me or even sent me a message, I would have done away with it. Really? <laughs> Ow. You know, your little fire didn't even warm it up. Frodo's like, well, you know, a hammer or something. Gandalf says, if you really want to destroy it, the only way that could happen is to throw it in Mount Doom. He says, not even the greatest dragon of the past could have destroyed this. Page 61. There is only one way. To find the cracks of doom in the depths of Ordru in the fire mountain and cast the ring in there if you really wish to destroy it, to put it beyond the grasp of the enemy forever. I do really wish to destroy it, cried Frodo. And then he catches himself. Because what does that mean? I do really wish to destroy it. It means I, personally, Frodo Baggins, wish to destroy it. That is, I wish to be the agent of destruction. Or, well, to have it destroyed, what's the difference? Do you mean it yourself and have someone else do it? Yeah, the first sentence is entirely in what's called the active voice. He's going to do the destroying. The second sentence is entirely in the passive voice. Or if I can have somebody over there do it. Because what does that obviously entail? Well, if you have to find the cracks of doom in the fire mountain, where does that mean you have to go? To Mordor. I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I'd never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? You could really just put all that under that one question. Why? Such questions cannot be answered. Next. I mean, notice Gandalf's very blunt there. Why are you asking such foolish questions? You may be sure it was not for any merit that others do not possess. Not for power or wisdom at any rate. In other words, you weren't chosen, Frodo, because of your great wisdom or your great might. He's a three-foot-tall person. But you have been chosen. And you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Notice the thing Gandalf adds in to the previous sentence. It's not just strength and wits anymore. It's strength and heart and wits. What's meant by heart? Courage to actually go into it. Courage to actually go and do it. Will. Okay. Soul. Integrity. All those things, I think. But I have so little of those things. Won't you take the ring? And Gandalf jumps away and says no. Why? Why does the ring tempt Gandalf? He knows he could do a lot with it, and he knows what he would become. What does he say? Do not tempt me. Yeah. The way of the ring to my heart is by pity. Because he knows, with the power of the ring, I, who am good, could achieve much good. But what's the problem with that? Do not tempt me. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe, unused. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. But why not use it for good? What is the ring? Evil. It's inherently evil. Can something inherently evil ever be used for good? 
In other words, Tolkien seems to be suggesting that this idea is not true. The ends justify the means. What would the ends be of using the ring? Destroying Sauron? Restoring order? Plant, you know, if you're Sam Gamgee, planting gardens? Making everywhere Lothlorien or Rivendell? That would be the ends. That would be good. But why, at least in the case of the ring, why can't that be done? Because the means are the ring. The means are the ring, and the ring is evil. Therefore, what's going to happen? Every bit of what is achieved <coughs> will be tainted. And we could jump off from there if you wanted to get into, you know, real hot topics. We could start talking about all kinds of stuff in the real world. Okay? We won't. Because we'll never finish the fellowship of the ring. Mm. So Gandalf says, I shall have such need of it. Great perils lie before me. So he says, Frodo, Frodo, the decision lies with you, but I will always help you. I will help you bear this burden as long as it is yours to bear. Notice what he doesn't say. Frodo, you must take the ring. You must go to Mordor. You must destroy the ring. And I'll tag along. He doesn't tell him what to do. All he says is, your burden to bear. I'll stand beside you. I will help you. Whatever you choose to do. So if Frodo had said, well, I'm just going to sit here fat, dumb, and happy for the rest of my life. Where Gandalf had said, no, you can't do that. You must not according to how Tolkien has drawn Gandalf. Gandalf would say, okay, then I'm moving in. Because <laughs> you're going to need protection, little man. What are you thinking about? What have you decided to do? Gandalf asked, page 62. No, or yes, or I must keep the ring, I guess, to keep it guard. I ought to leave Bag End, the Shire. Leave everything and go away. Why? What does Frodo think he can do for the Shire by leaving it? Protect it? Keep it safe? What else? This doesn't really come up until you get to the very end of the novel. Keep it the same. He thinks by leaving the Shire, if he returns to the Shire, the Shire will be the same. It won't have changed. What's the problem with that? Everything changes. You know, famous Greek philosopher said, life is flux. Everything changes. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, I've never brought this up in this class before. I don't know why I'm keeping my mind just now. Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story called Soldier's Home about a soldier from Public Dunk, Oklahoma, I mean, some little small town, I think it's Oklahoma, who goes off and fights in World War I and then stays after in Europe for a little while and then comes back home. The only problem is, Poe Dunk isn't what it was when he left it. Part of the reason for that is because he isn't who he was when he left it. He has seen and done things that he never would have seen and done when he was in small town Oklahoma. When Frodo and the others return to the Shire, they're not the innocent, fat little hobbits that they were. Their eyes have been opened to the big world. Remember that scene where Aragorn... No, we haven't had that scene. We'll talk about it in just a moment. Um... It's a problem when I have one class 
And then I do, you know, I did all of Fellowship of the Ring on one night, Monday night. Um, I get a little confused. Okay. So Frodo says, I'll leave. What's Gandalf's response? Didn't see that coming. He said, you know, you can know hobbits and everything about their ways in two months. And then they can say or do something that you never would have seen happening in a hundred years. But Gandalf says, you don't need to go by yourself and grab Sam Gamgee. Plucks him through the window. Why? Because Sam stopped clipping the hedge. He's been quiet for a while. Why does Sam want to go along with Frodo? Because he's curious. He's curious about what particularly? Somebody elves. said elves, man. He loves elves. He's heard Bilbo talking about elves. He wants to see an elf. And frankly, put yourself in Sam's shoes. Who wouldn't? Okay. Who wouldn't want to see an elf? Let's use a you know, quote unquote real world example. Who wouldn't want to see an alien? I don't mean somebody coming over the northern or southern border. I mean out of this world, close encounters of third alien alien. Okay. But most people probably would. Out of distance. <laughs> Maybe not up close. So now we're going to skip a lot. Frodo comes up with the idea of selling Bag End, okay, moving off to the country, off to Buckleberry. And so he sells everything, he gives stuff away. They make their way off to his new home, and the conspiracy is unmasked. Mary essentially says, Frodo, how stupid do you think we are? You know, I can't count the number of times I saw you walking down the lane. That you saw the SBs, the Sackville Baggins, is coming, coming. Not an accident, by the way, that Tolkien gave them that name so that he could use that abbreviation. The sons of. Uh, and you suddenly disappear. And then I see you reappear after they go by. I knew something was up. Okay. So they leave the home. And notice I'm, I'm skipping an awful lot. Okay. But notice, they don't have to flee from Black Riders. The Black Riders aren't hot on their scent, as in the film. Okay? The Black Riders are in the Shire, however. Sam overhears one at his father's door as Sam is leaving to catch back up to Frodo. And they decide to take a shortcut, so they go through the old forest. And as usually happens with shortcuts, what happens? Yeah, it turns into a long cut because they get at, as Sam would say, some of them do at least, by old man Willow. Tom, Pom Tom Bombadil comes and rescues them, takes them to his home. And they go into the house of Tom Bombadil. This is um, about page 131. It's in the chapter in the house of Tom Bombadil. And Tom is telling them a story. They have, they've been there for a while, but they don't know exactly how long because time just kind of seems to stop. And Tom's singing, and images are coming to mind, and they're kind of drifting in and out of consciousness. In 131, when they caught his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore. The western shore refers to Valinor, the realm of the gods. Okay. Back at the time when the world was flat. See, in Tolkien's cosmology, in the book The Silmarillion, when Eru Iluvatar creates Arda out of the song sung by the Ainur, the Valar, the world is at first flat. Middle Earth is over here. There's a big ocean here. There's actually an island here. And then way over here is the land of Eleanor. And you can get on a boat, go from here to here to here, and vice versa. Okay? But because of what happens once the elves get over here, and they live for a while, and then there's a battle, because one of the elves is an idiot, Uru Iluvatar, God, does this. And he bends the earth and makes it, I need to redo that, 
like this. So now, there's a gap. You can't sail in Frodo's day from Middle Earth to Valinor. It's impossible without divine help. Okay? Put it that way. So, Tom is singing about when the world was still like this. And still on and back, Tom went singing out into ancient starlight when only the elf sires were awake. The elves were the first sentient or conscious beings awoken by Iluvatar. He kind of goes, and they wake up. Then men, then dwarves. Okay? Then suddenly he stopped, and they saw that he nodded as if he was falling asleep. And the hobbits sit before him, and look at the word Tolkien uses. They're present at a fairy and drama. <laughs> One of the things that Tolkien kind of talked about in the fairy story essay. Frodo can't tell whether the evening or mo morning, the evening of one day or many days have passed. He's just sitting there. And he finally speaks and says, Who are you, Master? Who are you, Master? He's acknowledging there's a difference between Tom Bombadil and themselves. And Tom goes, eh? What? Like he's waking up with his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only... He speaks in riddles, right? Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. And so he asks Frodo a question. Tell me who you are alone, yourself. Nameless. Okay. Alone. Yourself. Nameless. Okay. Well, if you are alone, and I mean really alone, I don't mean like you go off somewhere by yourself for a while. I mean you are completely, totally cut off, separated. Nothing else exists but you alone. Yourself. You're it. And nameless. Why would, if you were the only thing that existed, why would you be nameless? One, you wouldn't need a name. Two, where do you get names from? From others. Okay. Tell me who you are, alone, yourself, nameless. What's Tom saying? I am alone, myself, <coughs> nameless. How did I begin that, though? And, I, and I'm, I'm almost convinced of this. Right? But I could be wrong. Not many people think this is the case. I think Tom is... A manifestation, at least, of God. Okay? Maybe Tom is the Holy Spirit because of some things he's going to say. Okay? But you are young and I am old. Eldest. That's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river in the trees. Okay? What river and what trees? The withy window, or the brandy wind, possibly, and the old forest. Okay, so what does that mean? Forests come and go. So he's older than 2,000 years. No. Tom remembers the first raindrop in the first acorn. The first raindrop. Okay. In other words, he was here before any rain ever fell. He made paths before the big people, that is, before the elves woke up and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the Barrowites. When the elves passed westward from here to here, Tom was here already. That's not the beginning of time, but it's getting pretty close. Before the seas were bent, he knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, 
before the Dark Lord came from the outside. Okay, now that tells us a lot more, but it might refer to two separate events. Okay? Before the Dark Lord came from outside might refer to, the other day I put up on the board, Melkor, who became Morgoth when he kind of fell. Well, Morgoth, because of things he did in Valinor, leaves Valinor, comes over to Middle-earth, and sets up his kingdom. That might be what Tom's referring to here. The Dark Lord came from the outside to Middle-earth. Okay? And therefore made the night and dark something to be feared. That's one possibility. Here's another one. Then Tom's going even farther back in time than that. In Tolkien's cosmology, as I said the other day, Eru Luvatar creates these beings called the Ainur. He gives them voices. They sing. And they all sing their own little song, but each of their own little songs at the beginning of the Silmarine all works together to make this beautiful harmony. Except for Melkor. Melkor introduces discord. <laughs> kind of a sound. Okay? The rule of Uvatar doesn't really like that, so he kind of, he, I think it is, he raises his left hand. The music stops. They start to sing again. It's all beautiful. Melkor introduces more discord. Uvatar raises the right hand. It all stops. Third time. Music, harmony, discord. This time, Iluvatar stands up, and he's pissed. <laughs> and he says, now I'm going to show you what you're saying. In other words, you thought you were just singing. You weren't. You were creating. So when they first sang, he shows them, as it were, a movie reel. Off into the future. Okay? And they see creation. They see the stars come into being. They see planets come into being. And then he shows the first little bit of discord, this, this darkness, this evil coming in. And he tells Melkor, that's what you did. But hold on. Because nothing you do can overcome what I can do. And he says, here's the second song. And he shows them. And so what we see in that vision is every time Melkor introduces that discord, some horrible ugliness enters the universe. Okay. And at the end of all that, that section, Melkor leaves the presence of Uru Iluvatar and goes down into Arda because there he thinks he can rule. I think that's what Tom's referring to when he says, I was here before the Dark Lord came from outside. And that's why I think Tom is probably a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You know, which Genesis says, the spirit that brooded upon the face of the earth, that Tom is kind of the overarching guardian, but he's not going to get involved. Why? Because it's not his problem. The problem of the ring is the problem of mortals. Okay. So, Tom tells them where to go when they leave, and they do, of course, just the opposite. He says, you know, you're going to see these stones on these barrows. Leave them alone. Don't go near them. Fog comes. Frodo goes up on one of the barrow mounds, and he goes past the stone and disappears. Okay. They all get captured. Page 141. They're all captured by the barrel light, and Frodo's thinking, yeah, I could escape. I could get away. Gandalf wouldn't hold it against me. He'd say, save yourself, Frodo. But something inside Frodo says, no, I can't do that. The courage that had been awakened in him was now too strong. He could not leave his friend so easily. And suddenly he does what? He reaches for a sword and hacks at that arm that's crawling towards him. And then he remembers Tom Bombadil. And he starts to sing the song Tom taught him. Tom comes and rescues him. 
Okay. What does Tom give them that he removes from the barrel? Dagger. Daggers. Swords. Okay. Who made the swords? Aragorn's ancestors. We're told. Men of Western Essa. What were they made for? To fight the forces of the witch king of Angmar, top of page 146. These swords were created to battle okay, the Nazgul. The captain of the Nazgul and his forces. This is going to become very important later on. Okay. So, Tom leads them how to get to the Prancing Pony. They go to the Prancing Pony. And Pippin has a little too much to drink. Frodo's sitting off in the back corner next to a guy named Strider. And Strider tells him, you better shut your friend up. So Frodo does what? Gets up on the table, starts singing about the man in the moon. He's also maybe had a little bit to drink and does what? Slips the ring on his finger when he falls, sticks his finger in his pocket and disappears. Slinks back to where he was sitting and Strider says, well, now you've done it. Now you've put your foot in it, or should I say finger, Mr. Baggins. And all of a sudden, Frodo knows this guy knows too much. All right? So, we get chapter 10, Strider. And Strider doesn't tell them everything at first, but he says, I'm here to help you. And they talk for a while, page 165. Um... Strider talks to them about the Black Riders and says, I'm older than I look. I might prove useful. They're going to come on you in the wild, and you don't want that to happen. They are terrible. And they see his face looks like he's in pain. And he says, will you take me? And Sam speaks up. With your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. Destroyer, here he warns, and he says, take care, and I say yes to that. And let's begin with him. He comes out in the wild, and I never heard no good of such folk. He knows something that's plain, and more than I like. But it's no reason why we should let him go leading us out into some dark place, far from help, as he puts it. Okay. Sam doesn't trust him. And Sam says, well, uh, Strider says, you learned your lesson in caution well, Sam. And then Barnaby Butterbur shows up, the innkeeper. And he delivers a letter to Frodo that he should have delivered how long ago? Three months. Yeah, over three months. Right? And Barnaby says, you know, you, you, you take care of your own business, but I wouldn't be taken up with no ranger. And Strider says, who would you, fat innkeeper? Are you going to help him off in the wild against black riders? Me? Let breed? No. Right? And so Strider says, they come from Mordor. If that means anything, Parliament, save us. That's the worst news that has come to Bree in my time. He's heard of Mordor. Never been there, obviously. He's never been outside Bree. Right? So they read the letter, and the letter ends... Okay. The letter says, leave by midsummer day. But then it ends with a little poem. Make sure it's the real Aragorn. And Frodo says, why didn't you tell me you were Gandalf's friend? It would have said time, would it? I mean, really. Would you believe me? What made them believe that Strider is who he says he is? The very fact that they have written proof from Gandalf. But is it written proof? Not for Sam. Top of the next page. 
How do we know you are the stroider that Gandalf speaks about? You never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came out. You might be a play-acting spy, for all I can see, trying to get us to go with you. You might have done in the real Strider. Took his clothes. What have you to say to that? And Strider says something very rational and logical. <coughs> then if I was a play-acting spy, I could kill you now and take the ring. Makes a lot of sense. He stands up. He suddenly seems a whole lot taller. But he says, I am the real Strider. And if by life or death I can save you, I will. Frodo says, you know, there is something about you that made me accept you. You know, I, I think his spies would seem well fairer and feel fouler, if you understand. And Strider's like, yeah, I understand. So I feel foul. I look foul and feel fair. Is that it? Okay. One prop among many, I'll admit. One problem I've always had with the films was the casting of Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn. Why? What's wrong with Viggo Mortensen? He's pretty handsome. He's pretty. I mean, you could be the staunchest heterosexual male and you still say, he's gorgeous. You know, like Henry Cavill. It's just not fair that anybody should be that good looking. Okay? Should Aragorn be gorgeous? No. I mean, even if you throw mud on Viggo Mortensen, let him grow stubble for three or four, he's still attractive. Aragorn shouldn't be. I've always thought, really from the time when I first finished Lord of the Rings at the age of 17, of one actor who would play Aragorn supremely well, and this is because not only the guy's build, but his look and his voice. Sam Elliott, if you know who Sam Elliott is. Okay? Look him up. Um, he's about 6'4". He's lanky. And he's got this deep, grumbling, kind of growling voice. He's handsome, but he's not gorgeous. Right? He usually plays a cowboy, or a Texan, or a soldier. One of those three. Every now and then he gets put in as a uh, kind of a comic character. If you, if you watch Parks and Rec, or if you watch Parks and Rec, he played this kind of hippy-dippy um, character, somebody, somebody done. Okay? But he goes on and says, but I am Aragorn. Those verses go with my name, etc. So... They go off with Aragorn, and they make their way to Weathertop. On their way, Sam sings a little verse about Gilgal that he learned from Bilbo. They get to Weathertop, and page 191, they now know the Dark Riders are on their tail. Okay, the Black Riders. And Mary says, tell us more of Gilgal. Do you know any more of that old lay? that you spoke of, and Strider says, I do indeed. So does Frodo, because it concerns him too. Okay. And Frodo says, I only know a little bit. So Aragorn sings the Lay of Tenuvia. Sings the Lay of Tenuvia. And it's this beautiful love poem. Okay. In the Silmarillion, the section dealing with Baron and Luthien, which is really about the largest section. It's this fantastic love story about, you know, Baron, a man, meets Luthien, an elf woman who's actually half angelic being. Her mother is a Maya, okay? Uh, falls in love with her. Her father says, you can't marry her unless you bring me a silver oil from the crown of Morgoth. You know, Satan. Unless you go down to Satan's kingdom and cut a jewel from his crown. Bring that to me in your hand, then you can marry her. And he does, at the cost of his own life. But he comes back from the dead briefly. They live happily ever after. She forgoes her elvish destiny. That is, she won't be immortal. She will die like a human. And when she dies, she will be completely, forever, eternally separated from her, her 
parents. Okay? If you go to Tolkien's grave in Oxford, he has his name, birth and death dates, Baron. And then you see his wife's name, birth, birth and Beth, death dates, Luthien. Tolkien, by doing this, because his wife predeceased him, I believe. Today is the anniversary of his death, by the way, in 1973. So, what, 42 years? Um, for Tolkien, the tale of Baron and Luthien was he and his wife. He met his wife when he was 16, I believe. 16 or 17. Fell in love, but um, his guardian, who was a Catholic priest, a very stern Catholic priest, but a very loving and gentle Catholic priest. His mother died when he was 10 or so. And so he and his brothers were raised by this priest. This priest forbade him to see her until he was of age, 21. On his 21st birthday, he wrote her a letter and they were married like within, I think it's like two or three months. I mean, they, when they met each other, they knew. And they were teens, okay? 16, 17 years old, something like that. So Strider tells him this story. Why? Well, it does concern Strider because Strider is a descendant of Baron and Luthien. As we're going to hear in the Council of Elrond, Elrond is. Okay. Aragorn's family traces back to Elros. Okay. Elrond's family goes back to Elrond because Elrond is still alive. That's how old he is. Okay. We're going to find out in a moment. So the Black Riders come. And what does Frodo do? Puts the ring on. Why? I guess something tells him to. And he's not yet strong enough to disobey, as it were. Okay, it's nighttime. The black riders come. They're all dressed in black. How well do Aragorn, Merry and Pippin, Sam, Frodo see the black riders? Not well, but when Frodo puts the ring on, he sees them very clearly. Why? He's entering their realm. Exactly. He's entered their realm by putting the ring on. By becoming invisible to this world, he becomes visible to the kind of nether realm, as it were. So he gets stabbed in the arm. And the blade that he gets stabbed with breaks off. Okay, so now he has this poison tip in his arm. Aragorn can help him a little bit, but not fully. So they make their way to the Forge of Bruinen, this river on the border of Rivendell. They meet up with Glorfindel, not Arwen. Utterly asinine. Anybody know why Peter Jackson put Arwen in there? And why? I think she's in one of the Hobbit films. He's actually said, purely, purely for demographic reasons. He said, I know there will be a large number of women coming to see this film. They need to have someone they can identify with. In other words, where was the artistic purpose? Where was the advancement of the story purpose? Not there at all. What happens when you start making art according to demographics? And I don't care what the demographics are. Because keep in mind, demographics can be broken down very specifically to not just men, women, white, black, Chinese, Hispanic. You can go, you know, Men from Alabama, <laughs> women from Wisconsin, and every little permutation in between. So are you going to start throwing in every little demographic just to make sure everybody's happy? What kind of story are you going to end up with then? Blech. 
it's not going to be a story. It'll be the Harbury's Handbook or the Telephone Book. Okay, okay. soapbox over. Um, so they make their way to the Fort of Bruin, and Frodo just gets across on Dwarfin Ellsworth, and he says, just before fainting, page 214, go back. Go back to the land of Mordor. He stands upright in his stirrups. He brandishes his sword, which keep in mind is you know, a foot and a half long. It's a dagger, really. It's not a sword. Okay? And the riders halt. And his enemies say, come back. Come back. To Mordor we will take you. The ring. The ring. Almost like a chant. By Elbereth and Luthien the fair, you shall have neither the ring nor me. Elbereth, wife of Manwe, queen of the gods. What the vast majority of scholars have said is this is Tolkien's way of working in Mary, his Catholic theology, queen of heaven. Okay? And her name does have power within the tale. You hear someone say, by Elbereth the Fair, and orcs and black riders usually stop in their tracks, at least for a moment. Okay? You shall have neither the ring nor me. And then the leader, the captain of the nine, the witch king of Angmar, rides forward, stands up in his stirrups, raises his hand, and Frodo can't talk anymore. And his sword does what? Breaks falls to the ground. And were it not for a little law that Elrond had about that river, Frodo would be lost at that point. But once the riders step into the river, the river starts to flood. Gandalf adds some you know, finishing touches to it as well. And Frodo faints. Okay? Many meetings. Frodo wakes up in the house of Elrond. He's healed, mostly. Why do I say mostly? Because every October 6th, his arm goes numb or he's in pain from that wound. Okay? It's never fully, completely healed. <clears throat> and he and Gandalf talk, about, talk a lot. Gandalf tells him that the lights he saw just before he faded were Glorfindel as he really is. See, Glorfindel is an elf who lived for a time in the Blessed Realm, in Valinor, where the gods dwelled. Okay? And he says, elves who have lived there live in both realms simultaneously. Like in some kind of astral projection or something like that. His body's over here, but his spirit's still living with the gods. Okay? <clears throat> Um, he sees Elrond for the first time, and we get a description of Elrond. But I want to go on to the Council of Elrond. Okay, I've said this is the second most important chapter in the entire novel. We get an introduction. We see who all is invited to, or who all is there. They've not been invited. They just show up. <clears throat> and what happens? Gimli the dwarf speaks first. He says an emissary from Sauron came. Asks about this ring. It is the merest of rings. It's a mere trifling that Sauron wants. If you can give any information about uh, Baggins. Right? So he finishes and Elrond finally speaks and says, Okay, we're here to decide the doom of the world. Doom doesn't mean end. It just means judgment. Okay? And he says, you were called hither, but not by me. Okay? What did Gandalf say to Frodo about the ring? And Bilbo's ownership of it, and Frodo's ownership of it. They were meant to have the ring. Similarly, all these individuals were meant to come to Rivendell. And Elrond says, you are here in this very nick of time by chance, as it may seem. 
Yet it is not so. Elrond doesn't believe in chance. He doesn't believe in coincidence. Rather, what does he say? It is so ordered that we who sit here and not others. If you've been reading the Boethius material, you probably see how, by now, it is so ordered. We'll talk a little bit more about that once we get into Two Towers and the end of the uh, Return of the King. So, Elrond speaks first. He talks about Numenor. He talks about being at the battle when Sauron had the ring cut off his hand, and Frodo's like, what do you mean you remember? Because that was like thousands of years ago. He says, my memory goes back long before then. And it just, at that point, hits Frodo how old the elves are. He's going to meet an elf later on who's even older than Elrond. An elf who is not one of the first elves awakened by Eru Iluvatar, but is the daughter of one of those elves, Galadriel. Galadriel may look like a hot young chick, but she's older in dirt, just about. Okay? 10,000 years old. Something like that. Okay? So he says, you know, I was the herald of Gil-galad when Sauron fell, blah, 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 blah. I saw Isildur cut the ring off his finger, and he didn't destroy it, etc. Okay? Boromir jumps up. He says, let me talk about Gondor, because he thinks Elrond has slighted Gondor. And he mentions, a dream came to my brother, twice I think it is, and then it came to him, and the dream had a little poem with it. He says, and the wise people said, Imladris is Rivendell, so I've traveled all the way up here. Well, how far is it? I think it's something like 110, 120 leagues. Okay. So he says, that's why I've come. Seek the sword that was broken. Find Isildur's bane. Aragorn stands up and says, and here your answers will be found. Here is the sword that was broken. Lifts the sword, puts it and the broken blade pieces on the table. What does Boromir say? To use a little bit more colloquial form than perhaps Tolkien did. Who the hell are you? And who are you? And what is your business with Minas Tirith? Now what could Aragorn say at that point? I am your future king. Sit down and shut up. He could say, I am the heir of Isildur, Elendil's son, kings of the men of Westernessa, and Gondor, and Anor. Sit down and shut up. Aragorn doesn't say a thing. Who does? He is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, said Elrond. And he is descended through many fathers from Isildur, Elendil's son of Minas Ithil. And Frodo's like, oh, thank God, finally. Then the ring's yours. You take it. Why? Because he just said he's Isildur's heir. Isildur had the ring. He cut it from Sauron. Frodo's thinking, you know, finders keepers. Not quite. So Gandalf tells Frodo to pull the ring out, and he does. And Boromir says, then is the doom of Minas Tirith come at last. He thinks the words of the poem meant, then Minas Tirith will come to an end. And Aragorn's, no, you, you, didn't, you didn't understand it quite. The words were not the doom of Minas Tirith, but doom and great deeds are indeed at hand. For the sword that was broken is the sword of Elindo that broke beneath him when he fell. And notice what he says. Isildur's bane has now been found. Do you wish for the house of Elindo to return to the land of Gondor? What does he mean by that question? Who's in charge of Gondor at this point? Denethor, Boromir's father, 
who is the steward of God. Aragorn is asking, do you want the king to return? Do you want the kingship to take over for authority to be rightly restored? I was not sent to beg any boon. In other words, I'm not here looking for handouts. But, you know, if, if such a sword could come back, notice, out of the shadows of the past. What does he mean? There's an article in, um, where was it? Daily Telegraph, I think, yesterday. Telegraph or The Guardian. About a, uh, a professor of history somewhere in Spain who has argued that he discovered who the real King Arthur was. And he has identified the ten famous battles that Arthur fought at. Based, these are based in a manuscript from a Welsh monk in the ninth century called the Annals of the Kings of Britain by a monk named Nennius. You can look it up online. Okay. This guy says that Arthur wasn't actually a king. He was a general, and he was Scottish. And he fought all of his battles around the area of Strathclyde in southern Scotland, really the border land between Scotland and England. Okay? But if he's correct, then that would mean that we might actually at some point in the future be able to find archaeological evidence supporting it. Including what? Because we have them from this period. Including swords. What Boromir is saying is, come on, you're telling me Excalibur is real? The sword that was broken Elendil's sword, that's real. Imagine for just a moment what would happen if somebody discovering an undiscovered, previously undiscovered cave in the southwest corner of Wales, which is one of the traditional locations of Arthur's kingdom, or the borderlands southeast, uh, southwest, northwest, southwest Scotland, northwest England, or there. Somebody uncovers a cave, they traipse on through, and they find a stone with a sword sticking out of it that has written on it in Celtic runes Excalibur. Or Arthur had me made. Just imagine that for a moment. What would that do? That would completely turn British history on its head. Okay? That's what Aragorn saying here is kind of suggesting. Bilbo jumps up, comes to Aragorn's defense. And when he finishes, Aragorn looks at Boromir and says, I don't hold it against you. I don't look like the kings of old. Why? Because I'm not one of them. I am, he says, merely a descendant. But <laughs> he's the, the, the descendant through whom kingship has been passed down. Okay? So what's he really saying? Mr. Prime Minister, David Cameron, do you want the house of Arthur to return? Because it would be like the house of Windsor currently occupying you know, the throne, they're merely stewards. The real king isn't back yet. And it'd be like some guy showing up, sixth century dress saying, I'm Arthur. Okay? So he goes on and talks now, Aragorn does. And he says, Gondor, Boromir, yeah, it's been a stalwart tower, but we, we riders, we rangers, we played a different part. And what does he mean? You had your walls protecting you down there. We didn't. And he says, we protected the people up north. And he gives a description. He says, there's one country, he's talking about the Shire. He says, where people are totally unaware of what's going on in the world outside. And if they must remain simple and free from care, simple they will be. In other words, it's our duty to keep them that way. 
Now, some people would say, no, it's not. The people of the Shire, the hobbits, ought to know what the real world's like. Aragorn says, no, they shouldn't. Why? They should stay innocent. Okay? But they're not going to. Because the world changes. So, we hear the rest of the talk, Council of Elrond. Gandalf talks. Gandalf tells them what Saruman said to him. They now know Saruman is evil. Okay. And they finally come to down to, okay, so here we, we now have the whole history of the ring. What do we do with it? Now what? What's Boromir's choice? What does Boromir want to do? No, Boromir wants to use it. Why? He's a soldier. He's thinking, it'll give me the biggest gun in the world. It'll give me the greatest weapon. Use it, okay, to destroy our enemies. The others say, we can't. Why? It's inherently evil. Anything done with it will be touched by evil, therefore. Okay, so what other option? Let's give it to Tom Bombadil. After all, what happened when Tom Bombadil saw Frodo put the ring on? He saw him. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> he saw him. Oh, the Frodo lad there. Frodo gives it to Tom. What does Tom do? And it disappears. Frodo's like, ah! Tom, chill. And then he hands it in his hand again. And he puts it on, and he doesn't disappear. Okay. Gandalf advises against this. Why? Because he says it's not Tom's problem. And they say, yeah, but he can protect it. You know, he has a power. He says, no, it has no power over him. Why? Because Tom is his own master. Well, who is really his own master? Are you the captain of your destiny, the master of your fate? No. You get out, you get in your car, and some idiot runs a red light, and they hit you. Well, then you're a pretty poor master of your fate and destiny if that happens. How many of you generate your own electricity every day to power up your, you know, your phone or your car? How many of you go out and kill your own meat, raise your own? We're all completely dependent. D. Out of, away from, pendant. It means hanging or swinging. We swing, hang from each other. Only someone who is independent, yourself, alone, nameless, has nobody else that they depend upon. So what other choices are there? One says, can we send it off to Kirdan at the Grey Havens? Can it, can can that be strong enough to protect? No. Can we keep it here in Rivendell? Elrond says, I don't have the power to withstand Sauron. Neither does Lothlorien. Send it over the seas. Send it to the gods. They won't take it. Why not? It's not their problem. Throw it in the ocean. Bottom, Mariana's Trench. Gandalf says, you can't do that. Why not? That's not permanent. Things that get thrown in the ocean have a habit or have a way of being found. Gandalf says, we need to take thought for getting rid of it forever. Well, how do you do that? You have to throw it in Mount Doom. Well, who's damn fool enough to go into Sauron's backyard and play around with his fire pit? Because that's essentially what you're talking about. Silence. Because nobody wants to even sneeze at that point. You know, it's like being in a committee meeting. Nobody wants to be chair of somebody. <coughs> Cost, you're it. I second that motion. So finally Frodo says, I will take the ring. Though I do not know the way. Okay. And Elrond says, you know, Frodo... <laughs> After everything we've heard, I think this is appointed for you. Again, the language, appointed, means what? There is an appointer. Okay? 
And I think that this task is appointed for you, Frodo, and that if you do not find a way, no one will. This is the hour of the Shire folk when they arise from their quiet fields to shake the powers and councils of the great. Notice, it's not the trite pablum that Peter Jackson puts in Elrond's mouth. This is the time that the little people can shake the world. What is Elrond getting at there when he says, it's the hour of the Shire folk when they arise from their quiet fields, the common, ordinary person has nothing to do with size, has nothing to do with power. It has everything to do with somebody going about their everyday life. And he says, and you know what? Maybe it's time for the everyday, ordinary person to influence the fate of the world. Sam says, I'm going. So they have to decide who else is going to be in the fellowship. Why? Because there's nine riders, so we're going to have nine walkers. Gandalf obviously has to go, because, I mean, he's kind of the guiding force behind this. Why do Aragorn and Boromir go? Okay, Aragorn's got one <clears throat> very personal reason. Elrond has told him, you don't get to marry my daughter, unless you become king of the united realm of Gondor and Ador. Only way he becomes king is if Sauron is defeated. Essentially the same kind of thing Luthien's father said to Baron. Okay. Boromir, Minas Tirith is south. He's going home. Their route lies south. Legless and Gimli, why do they go? They represent their, their peoples. So this is going to be a, oh, let's use a nice term from the first Gulf War, a coalition of the willing. This is going to be all the free peoples of Middle Earth, men, elves, dwarves, hobbits represented. Okay? Mary and Pippin. Elrond wants to send them back to the Shire. Why? To warn it. To prepare it. Gandalf counsels against that. He says, trust to friendship. Kind of interesting, because what wouldn't happen if Pippin doesn't go? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that very, very quickly. So the ring goes south. Okay. They try to go over Mount Carathras because Aragorn's afraid to go the way that Gandalf wants to go. And you know if Aragorn's afraid, this is not a safe place. And the mountain won't let them. So Gandalf says, there is another way. We go through the mines of Moria. Go under the mountain and come out the other side. Aragorn says, I'll follow you, but I tell you, Gandalf, beware, lest you pass the gates of Moria. Gandalf's already been there, okay, back before the Hobbit. He went in the mines of Moria. He got a map from Thorn Oakenshield's grandfather, I think it was, or father, that he then takes and gives to Thorin, okay? So he's been there. He knows what it's like. So they go to the mines of Moria, okay? And what happens? They come into the guard chamber. Gandalf has led the way safely. Aragorn tells the others, don't worry, don't fear. He never, has never gone wrong. He'll lead us out safely. He might not come out safely, but he'll lead us out safely. Okay? And in the guard room, there's a well. And frankly, I think Pippin's like a normal 14 or 15 year old boy. He's in his 20s which is about 14 or 15. And everybody else is getting their bedding ready for the night. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit, I would be pimping at this point. I want to see how deep that sucker is. And so he goes and he picks up a rock and... Gandalf hears that plunk and says, fool of a took. Throw yourself in next time and be done with it. Right? 
And what happens? A few seconds go by. They hear the tap of a hammer. And they're like, oh, crap. Because it's probably not the tap of a dwarvish hammer. All right? So they get ready, and a battle ensues. They find Balin's book. They read about what happened when Balin from The Hobbit got there. They started redoing the mines and all this kind of stuff. And then it kind of ends in that famous Monty Python scrawl. You know. Well, what's going on there? They're being attacked. And as they're reading that, they suddenly realize the drums, they're being attacked. They get out of the guardroom, Gandalf's left behind. They go down to the bridge of Casa Doom, and Gandalf finally makes it down. And what does he tell them? Uh, there's something up there that is powerful. Gandalf says, page 327. Did you meet the beater of the drums? Gimli asked. I do not know, but I find myself suddenly faced by something I've not met before. I put a shutting spell on the door. I know many, but I heard other voices. And then something else came, and it put a counter spell. It nearly broke me. For an instant, the door left my control. It began to open. I had to speak a word of command. That proved too great a strain. So now Gandalf is back down with them. He's at the bridge of Casa Doom, and as he puts it, he is spit. Like, he needs to plug in and recharge. However wizards do that, okay? And what do they discover? The beater of the drums? A ball rock. That is, another Maya, just like Gandalf is. But Gandalf is saying, I, I, I've never battled one of these, okay? This is Durin's bane. Gandalf does not let the Balrog pass the bridge. He says, page 330, you cannot pass. I'm a servant of the secret fire. That's Iluvatar. That's God. And a wielder of the flame of Anor. That means his sword. Okay? So Gandalf falls in the Khazad Doom. They make their way out. They go to Lothlorien, or they're led to Lothlorien, and they meet Galadriel and Celeborn. Right? And Galadriel kind of tests them. She reads their minds, so to speak, which Boromir doesn't really like, and Boromir says some foolish things. Aragorn tells him to never speak at all of the Lady Galadriel. And then Galadriel takes Frodo and Sam to look at her mirror. Obviously, I'm having to skip a lot. Right? And just before they leave, Galadriel gives them all gifts. What does she give Frodo? She gives him a glass, a little bottle, not like this, a little bottle on a string that he wears around his neck. In the glass, in the bottle, is water from the mirror of Galadriel that has captured the light of that star that was shining the night when he looked in the mirror. What did Sam see in the mirror? Anybody remember? He sees the Shire in tumult. The big tree that was there where they had the birthday party has been chopped down. He sees his gaffer kicked out of his hole on the side of the road with a stick and all his belongings in a kerchief. He sees Bagshot Row being dug up. And he's thinking, if I ever get back to the Shire, somebody's going to have hell to deal with. What does Frodo see? See somebody they think might be Gandalf. Sees a couple other things and it all goes black and he just sees an eye. And the more he looks at the eye, the closer he's drawn down to the water. And when he looks up at Galadriel, she's holding her hands up when he offers her the ring. She's holding her hands up and he sees on her finger a ring. But he only sees it because it kind of catches the light of this star. And he realizes she wears one of the three elven rings. And he asks her, how come I never knew what you were thinking when I put the ring on before? Because she tells him, anyone who wears one of the rings can know what the other people are thinking. She says, you never knew, you never tried, don't. 
Why don't? Because it's open a path. No. What must you be able to do? Dominate another person's will. In order for him to know what one of the other wearers of the ring was doing, a ring was doing, is he would have to be able to dominate their will. Right? To control them. He's just a little Frodo. He's not there yet. Okay. Back to the gift. She gives Frodo that. Sam gets rope and dirt. Okay. Aragorn gets a scabbard or sheath to draw a sword out of, such that the sword drawn from this sheath will never break. It's kind of a good thing to have, seeing as his family history of swords. Uh, what does Boromir get? It's a very fitting gift. He gets a big old WWE solid gold belt buckle. Why? Because he's a kick-ass soldier. Okay. Legless gets a new quiver to pull arrows out of. The arrows pulled out of that quiver will never miss their target. Okay. Gimli. Three golden strands of her hair. And they always want to kill him. I mean, for even for asking for that. And she said, what do you want with my hair? He says, I'll encase it in liquid crystal, and it will be the heirloom of all the dwarves. And she's just kind of touched by that, you know? She's like, oh, Gimli, stop. And so they leave. Okay, keep in mind, who is not with them? Because he's dead. Gandalf's not with them. What does Aragorn say when they finally arrive at Parth Galen? Parth Galen is, is they've, they've gone down the river Anduin, they've come to the falls of Rauros, they land on an island, and it's like, okay, now we have two fish or cut bait. Where, what is Frodo's task? Destroy the ring. Is that their task? No. Their task is to aid Frodo. So where does Frodo have to go? Ultimately, Mordor. Okay. Where's Boromir want to go? Minas Tirith. Where does Aragorn want to go? He's not quite sure. He wants to help Frodo. He also wants to help Minas Tirith. What's Aragorn's problem? He didn't know what Gandalf's plans were. But he is not the wimpy, self-questioning, doubtful character that he is in the films. Okay? So they get there and Frodo says, give me an hour. Let me go off and think. And he does, and they sit and talk. And I don't know how this happens. But they don't notice Boromir leaving the little circle. And Boromir goes off after Frodo. To do what? To talk. He doesn't understand. He still doesn't understand why they can't use the ring. So he tries to take it. Frodo puts the ring on, disappears. Boromir starts to head back down. Frodo runs to the top of the mountain. He still has the ring on, and he sits on this big stone seat. What happens there? He's got the ring on, so now he sees very far away. He looks up north, he sees orcs all over the Mirkwood. He looks down to the south, he sees ships coming out of the port of Harad. He looks at Gondor, he sees preparations for war. Everywhere he sees preparations for war. And then he looks towards Mordor. And he sees Mount Doom. And then he sees Baradur, Sauron's fortress. And we're told all hope left him. Why? Think of the biggest, most badass fortress you can imagine and put it on steroids. It, it's, it's just so massive. He's like, I can't. And then he sees the eye. And what does the eye do? Frodo's sitting here, he's on this mountain, there's another mountain over here, there's another mountain over here, and the eye goes, bing, bing, and then what? Bing, bing, it's getting close, it's triangulating. And it's about to nail him, and he suddenly hears a voice, take it off, fool, take off the ring. And at the last moment he does, Who's the only other person so far in the course of the novel we've seen use the word fool? Gandalf. 
I mean, we've heard people say folly and foolish, but in terms of calling somebody a fool, it, it's pretty much Gandalf. Okay? Is this Gandalf calling to him? We don't know, because the book ends, and then if we're in Britain and it's 1954, we have to wait four months for the next book to come out. Okay? Because it ends with Frodo and Sam getting in a boat and heading down the river and Sam punching holes in all these other boats. Why? So they can't be far. Frodo wants to get as far away from the other members of the fellowship for the simple reason he doesn't want to lead them to their deaths. Self-sacrifice? Yeah. Okay, let's stop there. So two towers on whatever day. Tuesday.